and I hope it's going to the channel. Oh, also we need to test this microphone. Hold up. Well, it looks like it's working. Yeah, I think we're good. Can I just... It's going to be uh, echo for a second. Yeah, we're good. Cool. Hey, right. everyone. <laughs> I'm going to pause that. Hello. Welcome to the live stream. Let's pop that up. We are Put doing this over some here. technical things, and then we will really commence. So, All hey, right. how is everyone doing? Um, tonight is not a regular live stream, if you're just joining in. Um, it Actually, the first meeting of the Polyglot Progress book club indeed which um for this month we read michael errard's babel, no babel no more and so we are going to talk about that and if you oh it's private <laughs> make it public make it public wait should i just start a new one no it, it won't differentiate so just make it private there's no way to make a new one it'll make this go public just what yep. shouldn't we just start a new one though because we did all that like confusion okay. is one person watching right now how they're just on here that should be good. All right. Welcome, everybody. Hey, everyone. <laughs> to the Polyglot Progress Book Club. We are currently two minutes late to our own book club because we were actually here, but uh, we were streaming to ourselves. This so is true. We've now made the book club public. <laughs> um, we did, right? I hope so. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um... Hey, if you're just tuning in and are a little bit confused, um, instead of doing a regular live stream right now, this is actually the first episode of the Polyglot Progress Book Club, which is a thing that I mentioned at the beginning <laughs> of uh, Thanks, Andy. Bed. Thank you, Andy. Um, so I mentioned that we were going to start a book club, and I was really excited about it, and mm -hmm. we're not totally sure how this is going to run because it is the first time that we're doing it. So if things you feel kind of don't go well or could go better in a certain way, feel free to give us feedback for that because uh, this is kind of the setup I thought of for this book club, but I'm sure as this live stream goes on, we're going to think of kind of better oh, totally. ways to go about this in yeah. future months. It's so. like our first interactive, but also a show type thing. So yeah. that's going to be interesting for us because normally with a live stream, we're going to like, we respond to every comment. But a lot of this is going to be like us talking about the book and then asking a question and then like responding to your comments about it and then like taking questions about the book, things like that. And so, yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, interesting so definitely give us your feedback. Basically, I guess just to start with our intro, um, we just wanted to kind of go over um, how, like, how this is going to run and stuff. And I know I also said that we were going to announce the upload schedule in this video, but there was a blizzard that kind of got in the way of Matt and I talking about our new upload this schedule. This is true. So basically, we'll come up with that right after this live stream, mm. and it'll be on Twitter tonight, pretty much. I just saw you look at new upload schedule, and I saw, like, a little flash of panic across your face, like, oh, we didn't talk about that. Um, oh, no. Yeah. So that so was fun to witness. Basically, how this is going to work, other than that, is we're going to talk about, um, it's sort of in general going to be a kind of a cross between our typical live streams and a podcast mm -hmm. so we're gonna kind of reference your comments and do interactive things but we're also just going to kind of talk to each other the way we would in a podcast mm -hmm. um so hopefully we'll find a nice little balance there but basically we're going to start off by talking about kind of our overall feelings about whatever book we read um in this case babel no more by michael Ayrard. if you haven't read it and want to read it after this uh i put a link down in the description. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of our overall feelings, like general book review. Did we like the book in general? Mm -hmm. um, was talk there anything we really it. liked, really hated? Um, then kind of like the lessons we learned from the book or like kind of new things that yeah. stood out to us in general on more less of like a book level and more of like a language learning level, I guess. And then we're going to talk about things that we disagree with i guess mm -hmm. um and i feel like some of this might overlap mm -hmm. if we don't go in the right yeah structure um and then at the end i'll announce our next book um if you're not in the discord for the book club 
you should join the Discord. I realize that we don't have a Discord link in the description, but we'll put it in here, I guess, when it ends. We'll mm -hmm. put it in the comments. Um, we took a vote on the book there, so if you're really dying to know what book is being read next month and you're in the Discord, you can actually go see what it is now. Um, but we do have that, so we'll announce that at the end as well, and then we can get started for the next book club. Cool. cool. All right. Where do you want to start? Just um, overall feelings? Yeah, so overall feelings... <laughs> I gave this book a 2.5 out of 5 stars on Goodreads. And then, like, explain the, the reasoning, because, like, I know you said in the beginning you, like, were really enjoying it. Yeah, so I had kind of a weird, wild ride with this book, I guess. Like, I really enjoyed it when I first started out, and I was really excited about it. We should also preface this with the fact that we read maybe half of this book this month. Um, yeah, Matt we, we started it in started August. This in August. So and then we with just school keep putting happening, the book down. So yes, I um, think if that doesn't say something about it, at least in terms of us, we were reading it and getting through it quick, mm -hmm. and then had a hiatus with it. Yeah, so we read like half of it this month, and then we did go back for this for the book club. But um, just to preface it, it did take us like five months to read this book. I don't think that's um, a normal thing, though. I think, like, Ophelia not, read it in, like, two weeks. It's not a book that should take you five months. Um, so when we first started reading it, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. It was exploring yeah. some stuff that I hadn't, like, heard about in language learning. Mm -hmm. It was also just, like, I don't know, it was just quirky and interesting, and I, I enjoyed it. I think I actually started reading it, come to think of it, before August. Really? Because I remember when <clears throat> I went to Philadelphia with your family, mm -hmm. we were reading it in the car. Both of us? Yeah, because I remember talking to you about one of and the things And that was before August. Yeah, that would have been like... Oh, wow. So I think we actually <laughs> started reading it, put it down, and then officially started reading it in August. Interesting. Oh, um, okay. Which says even more. It does. So we've been reading this book like on and off for like a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which is crazy. Uh, yeah, but I when we first started reading it, I thought it was really interesting. There was a lot of stuff that, um, I don't know, I just hadn't thought of or I hadn't known about. Like, the Mezzofanti stuff was yeah, all that was pretty new, for new me. to me. That was really new. Um, and that was one of the things that I think I enjoyed the most of the book, was that I learned a lot of stuff that I hadn't really known about, or even if it wasn't necessarily, like learning it because it wasn't more so like language tips that I hadn't known about it was more mm -hmm. so like people and all that sort of thing that I wasn't totally familiar with um, yeah I think I think one of the big things for me was it introduced me to a lot of the science behind language learning because mm -hmm. like we we know of it from like a very subjective standpoint and like we hear about other people's experiences and all of that's very subjective but then his take on all of this is very objective like he's not a language learner by any means he doesn't he goes to all these places with kind of like a dispassioned look to it and like is kind of just looking at it very critically which is good which is good i think for something like this but again like we had problems towards the end i actually you know? disagree that was one of the things i disliked the most out of the book his objectivity how objective it was and how like little he felt like a part of all of it i think mm. that the book could have benefited a lot from being written by someone who was a, a language a learner? language learner at the very least more so than he was like he he um what did he call himself like a a monolingual with benefits because he like <laughs> knew some of two languages or something yeah um but it just felt very strange his opinion sort of thing and he was also yeah. very much so like wow they yeah, do this and i it think kind of like a had he come at it, it from like a perspective of someone who had learned languages a bit more i think it would have conveyed some of the things a bit better um yeah, he kind of comes at it with like this notion of the unreal and like trying to explain this phenomenon and the thing yeah. is like just some people do it more than others is kind of like what he came to mm -hmm. and so it was like this big whole argument throughout the book and then like very lackluster yeah i'll conclusion. also say that we will spoil the book oh yeah uh, in this podcast so um if you don't want the book spoiled for you maybe go read the book and then come back um yeah, I, I just feel like it was fun at first, and then the lack of structure and just his distance from it was what really got to me in the end. Mm -hmm. um, because I did really enjoy the beginning, but I think also the beginning was kind of a bit more focused in one place. 
it focused much more on Mezzofonti and then kind of talked about other sort of language learners that were similar to Mezzofonti and it, yeah, it felt like it, it had a all these theme myths. and a thesis and a point mm -hmm. and then we started diverging and it would be like a few pages pretty much on each topic and he jumped from like a theory in science to like these people he'd met in one place to all this other thing and like I've seen the book described as being like part travelogue part biography part these other things like and I agree with that, but I don't mm. think that it worked. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it should have been a travelogue if he didn't want to be a travelogue, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, he obviously wanted to talk about the science of it, and him trying to put his energy towards, um, like, connecting to these people about, mm -hmm. like, the languages they speak, it, like, didn't really work for me, you know? And I don't know if that's just me. Like, I, I come to this book with, I think, a different, like, palette, because, like, as a person studying writing right now, just like a lot of this was I was just like oh this information's portrayed in a way that's very interesting mm. the structure is horrific <laughs> you know yeah. like I mean just the fact that all of it's mezzofonti in the beginning yeah and then he drops it goes somewhere else yeah he came back at the very end and I I was able to then see at the end I think where he was trying to go with the book and I could tell that it was meant to kind of be but it was like he tried to have a cliffhanger for us and it's like, this stuff doesn't need a cliffhanger. Yeah, basically it was like Mezzofonti went on and on, and then he, he like, talked about all these other things. And then at the very end, he's like, I found, actually, Mezzofonti's secret. And it, it, I honestly read it, and I was like... No, you, out loud, you were like, come on. No, could be just because it was such, like, a... It wasn't exciting and thrilling. And I was then able to understand that his whole point throughout the whole book was kind of that, like, mm -hmm. He's like there thesis. wasn't much... To, like, the, it wasn't, like, a crazy thing that Mezzofonti spoke all these languages. So it's not a crazy thing that all these other people speak all these languages because they all actually do the same exact thing. And it was just a myth that Mezzofonti just, like, picked up all these languages and knew yeah, that what was he the was thing. doing. He, he was trying to, like, distinguish between someone just, like, oh, over here in a language and now I speak it. Yeah, He's, like, I just puts think that the thesis was dropped for so long that then it didn't hit me hard enough in the end. <laughs> that, like, yeah, like it, I never got it was across very that it was, like, anyone can do this. And I feel like also the thing is, is that I had a hard time trying to figure out, like, that's at least what I'm trying to get from it now is that's what happened, but... I think also I had a hard time trying to figure out what his feels. stance was. I don't know what his because stance is. I told He's this so... to Matt too. I feel like this book made me feel so bad about myself almost yeah. as a language learner. No, I, I can relate with that because he kind of like, sh uh, I'm, excuse me, but it, like he kind of shits on polyglots and multilingualism. And, um, but at the same time, it's like hyper poly like he, I like the divide he does between hyper, like polyglotism and multilingualism because I think it's a thing we don't talk about enough because like multilingualism in a environmental sense of where you are it's like oh you need to pick up these patterns mm -hmm. of the languages around you um and it's really just pattern switching uh, switching as a, as opposed to code switching but then polyglotism is a different thing where like and he does talk about how like having a wider palette of things like having arabic and chinese and then german very different as opposed to, like, all the romance languages are, like, the same thing, essentially, mm -hmm. just different... That's patterns, essentially. Like, that's a multilingualism. Um, and just, like, I enjoyed that aspect, but anytime you talked about, like, a hyperpolyglot and, like, then tried to debunk them right away, like, yeah. it, all of it felt like it was, like, Mythbusters. That's what I, and I was like got from it was I... Like, it's not even, like, I go around feeling so much pride from how many languages I know, and, like... I even said this in the Q&A, like, I feel like a baby polyglot. I don't even yeah. know that, like, the languages I know that well yet. I'm working on that, and that's something I do. And, like, I don't feel like I'm, like, the smartest person in the world, because look at this, I study languages and all that. Yeah, but it was, like, this book open. almost, like, made me feel like I should feel, like, bad about even, like, trying to, like feel pr I think more so it was, like, I couldn't even feel proud of progress in languages, because it he just kind of, like, wrote everything off as, as like, like skills and but scores, like it's not know? like the, yeah it was like You're very strange speaker. like half the time it felt like he had like this crazy like you said almost like fetishization of like of, of what polyglotism who spoke is multiple languages but then right after he'd do that he'd like discount everything they did and he'd be like why do they waste so much time and doing then he's this? like oh you're all introverts so you can't even talk to people you're yeah. all just shy and it was weird very and i'm like strange. how do you feel about us like what I also, like, coming at it from a perspective of someone who makes documentary films, 
I was really interested to know kind of how the people who were in this book even mm. feel about this now because I kind of feel like Alexander? all of their things were handled kind of very disgustingly, honestly. I like Alexander. Like, just anyone. Like, he'd give their perspective and then he'd kind of, like you said, like, discount it very fast and, like, debunk everything they did. And it just felt like nothing was handled with, like, the care you have to handle someone's story with when you, I like... Know. Take you, someone's you can talk about and, like, this as a documentary student yeah, exactly. right now. Yeah, like, put it in a film or put it in a book. It just kind of felt like he, like, just used people to make points. And, and it like, felt, like, very weird to me. And, like, very kind of uncomfortable and kind of added to that feeling of, like, I feel like I'm being made to feel bad now about the things that I, like, Love. do yeah. and enjoy and stuff. And just, like, little things also that I think also just, again, tied into... The lack of structure, like, I'm not sure what his point was meant to be, so I'm not even sure if I should feel bad, or if he's trying mm. to say that I do, like, a great thing, or, mm. like, what it was entirely. It I've was been like so both. back and it's forth so on that. Strange. Yeah. And I think it's based on where he's talking, and then, like, he does this very strange thing where he, like, he's talking about, like, he, he does... It, for someone who doesn't understand a whole lot about the brain and, like, the physiology mm-hmm. of the human body, he makes it quite accessible i i'm gonna say yeah, not that as was ex- one accessible of my, you know um, favorite things was just how accessible everything was like all the scientific studies he talked about like um, i like his um brain as world model even though i don't totally get it i like it like it makes, i didn't love that because no. i just like locations in general then he was I, I would have rather just known where it was in the brain instead of the like, I globe i was like i don't know what that means he's like it's around um <laughs> he'd be like this is southern europe in the brain and i'm like i don't know what that means yeah no honestly i'm like so where's the prime meridian like what are we but explaining which way are we studies looking? i feel like was done very accessibly yeah. for someone who's not familiar with those scientific studies so i did appreciate that and then he would go talk to like the author of that study and like 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 the research done was immense and mm-hmm. i can't discredit the research like what went into this book is so much but uh, just yeah, like I agree. his handling of case studies and like his I own think, interactions honestly, was the, kind of weird. The book's weird. biggest problem, even was, was probably just the lack of structure. Just because, I mean, all that research, I think, then just wasn't structured in a way that made enough sense. And I think maybe some of the lack of structure came from his lack of connection to it. I think. I think that could. No be matter it. how much research you do into something, if you haven't experienced some of it or something close to it, it's going to be a lot harder. And I think he was missing that connection. And it's hard to, to it. convey that then when um, you don't have it. Especially because then some of his points, I feel like, as someone who's learned languages, I was right away able to, like, discredit and be like, no, that's not what's happening here. And just, like, little things, like, there was one point towards the end where he was talking about, like, systemization and how people might like learning languages so that they can count how many words they know, how many mistakes they make, how many books they own, how many chapters they get through, and reorganize their bookshelves. And, like, that's the whole reason why they study them is just to count, like, languages and words and things. And it just felt like reading it for me, like, that's not why I study languages, and sure, maybe people are different, but I think anyone who goes into studying languages with that as their idea of why they're going to enjoy studying languages will not enjoy studying languages, (laughs) Mm -hmm. because it's just, you, like, it's not a something that would give you any satisfaction in language learning there's so much more to it than just being able to count the number of vocabulary words that you have exactly i i completely agree and when he said when he got he had that list and like at the beginning of that list i was like okay you know words i get it like you know Mm -hmm. books i've gotten through okay i understand and then he was like books on a shelf uh like chapters i got through and like words i know and like errors i make i was like you're just like you don't get it he was saying that maybe like people view it as like collecting like languages and stuff but i think it's one of those things, and also he at one point said that most hyperpolyglots say that they have some innate thing that makes them better at language learning than other people, and I think that these are all things that me having spoken to other polyglots, and I guess hyperpolyglots at like polyglot conference and online and things like that through polyglot progress, I've heard no one say that. Yeah, I feel um, like, I also just feel like that um, notion of oh, there's something biologically about me that makes me better than you has just been, like, a thing we stay away from today. Because that's very, like... (laughs) That's a thing we don't want, I think... Yeah, I think it's just one of those things where it felt very distant because I know that people who learn lots of languages kind of discredit that immediately and are like, I don't have something special about me. 
like I just put a lot of time and effort in. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. And I think that's the thing. And like I, at one point, my professor actually asked me. He was like, "Do you think there's something about you that's predisposition to learn these languages?" Or, like, could anyone do what you're doing right now? And I was like, I don't know, maybe there is something about me, because I haven't had my brain looked at, so I, who knows, maybe exactly. there is something that's a part of me. Like, I can't say no, because I don't know. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I don't think it's that. Like, I think it's just how much work I put into it. Like, I, because I don't feel that learning languages is easy for me. That's mm-hmm. the thing, is a lot of people yeah. are like, oh, yeah. it's so easy for you. Like, I think I've done a lot of language study, but that's the thing, is I've done a lot of study um, like, I don't think it's easier for me to pick up languages. I think it's just that most people do not spend, like, an hour a day, like, with a textbook. And when I spent an hour a day with a textbook over a summer, I managed to pick up some Bulgarian. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's what, that's the crazy thing that set me aside from someone else when learning Bulgarian was that I studied every day. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's not, like, a crazy phenomenon. And I think also, like, I, like, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, like, I did not do well in high school French classes, and it's until, like, towards the end when I started learning German and Esperanto, and I was like, okay, this is how I study languages. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't an A-plus German student until, like, I went to Germany and realized the value of it, and, like, it changed how I viewed language learning, you know? I don't think it was even like that for me, it was just that the way that I was being taught in school was not a way that mm-hmm. allowed me to learn a language, honestly. Yeah, we talked about that a lot, like, getting out of school, making it easier because you have your own method. Yeah, and so when I started to figure out what worked for me, I was able to learn a language and it wasn't like all the like the DNA in my brain like kicked on and it was like <laughs> the language learning gene has been activated. It was just that I was like, okay, if I sit and I go through a textbook this specific way, I can pick up some words in a new language. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Um, no, I so know. I think it's just like little things like that that kind of felt very much so like he was an outsider and it just made it very clear that he wasn't a polyglot approaching other polyglots it was he was some other guy like a wild polyglot um in the background (laughs) um he's like i can see in its natural habitat like uh, like, david attenborough yeah like exactly like that's kind of what it felt like Mm -hmm. and it was he even says at the end he expected to go off and have it be like finding the loch ness monster and Which I is just of, weird. I got that, but I also got half the time him being like, I'm in love with the Loch Ness Monster. Like, I, this, what an amazing creature. Like I want to learn water. more. Um, it's like the shape of water. And half the time him being like, why do people think the Loch Ness Monster is cool? Like, there's nothing. It's just a giant fish. Yeah. Like, I, and I couldn't tell what his opinion was. No, he goes back and forth. I don't think but, the thesis was very clear. And it's it's disappointing that throughout the entire book it was like, this is what I'm thinking. And, like, also, the whole bit with Mezzofanti in the beginning, he's, like, overly excited. Mm. And it's so obvious that you can tell, like, what he's saying. The truth is a negation of it, you know? Which I didn't like being played with that way. I'm like, oh, dude, I can tell you don't believe in all this. Like, just tell me. Like, it was wasting my yeah, time. Yeah, that was... I felt like he very much so thought that Mezzofanti was a fake or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I kind of think like, he might be, too. Because which, like, the way he structured the way his he's argument I'm like, yeah, made me think fake. that. He says he speaks all these languages, but he doesn't. He just knows those set phrases. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, here's your spoiler, he just used flashcards and had a paper dictionary. He did exactly what I was saying. Like, when you study languages, you know languages. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's... I think that's pretty much all my kind of, like, (laughs) things on my overall feelings about the book. I just feel like the distance and then the lack of structure that I think arose from the distance killed me. And I really wish that he'd, like, from my perspective reading it, I wish that he'd gone through and edited this book after it was written. Mm -hmm. Because I get that it was supposed to be, like, his journey. And I I assume he did edit this many times because very little people just write something and then publish it. But... To me, it felt like it was, like, his journey and stream of consciousness, and I assume that's what he wanted, but to me as a reader, I just got so much lack of structure that it felt like his journal, and I wish that he'd picked through it and then rearranged things so that it would be a coherent piece that I would understand. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. We were talking in documentary class at one point about how very rarely are things in chronological order the best way to put them. Um, to make your point, and I wish that he'd heard that and rearranged this book so that yeah, things it could was... make points and not just be in his chronological journey of discovering hyperpolyglots. Because yeah, that's the thing. It was very much like a there was come with so me on much all over the place. Yeah, and like 
what I didn't like was, because even though it's all over the place, even though it's chronological, he travels throughout the world, and then information that is unrelated to his travels, he just kind of jumps in and, like, mm. gets away from that travelogue aspect of it. Yeah. Which annoyed me, I guess. But, like, in terms of language learning, did you learn anything from this book? What do you disagree with? Yeah, I'd also love to hear anyone who is watching who actually read the book, um, because I can see there's a few people in the comments who are like, I did not read it. Um, which is okay. Which is fine if you didn't want to read it and you just, if you're not, fi if you're fine with spoilers, like, you can feel free to come to the book club without reading the book. Um, just know that we will spoil things. But I'd love to hear your review out of five stars if you did read it and maybe a little bit on why. Um, so, there's that. Also, Michael, I see that question but we're not going to be answering questions that aren't related to the book here today so i apologize um just so you all know this is a strange live stream <laughs> so yeah so lessons learned um i'd say the coolest things to me were like some of the studies just because i was like hmm, i was like thinking about it yeah because it was really neat even though like i said i don't think it's necessarily like genetic disposition that's put me on the path for language learning like who knows maybe there is it's something that I'm always like intrigued by in anything I was really just kind interested. of like things that are like the correlations between things and mm -hmm. me being like is that why I'm the way that I am like is that this and then the other thing that was the most interesting to me was just like learning about new people yeah no I, I was really interested with a lot of the studies that were like oh some brains use oxygen more efficiently and then therefore like the the areas of the brain that are needed to like um make the pathways that are going to remember this new vocabulary word are activated like 20% faster in people who did this. And like, I, I kind of thought it was funny where he was like, oh, here's like the battery that you can like electrocute your brain. And mm -hmm. like, and he was like, it's been proven that like vocabulary increases by 110%, but you're also going to electrocute your brain to death. And I was like, nice. Yeah. So that was good. Oh man. You know? Yeah, I just, like, little things, just like the Myers-Briggs thing, which I'm very interested in. I want to ask everyone, if you know your Myers-Briggs personality type, please put it in the, Is the that comments like now. INFJ? Yeah, do you know what INFJ. you INFJ. So am I. Matt, <laughs> but that's oh, no, weird. I thought you were ENFJ. You think I'm an extrovert? Oh, no. Matt? You're, you're like a letter off than me, I thought. I'm not an extrovert. Um, I, no, I'm INFJ. Are you sure? Yeah. I think my T and my F were the same. One of them was... Yeah, I thought I think my T. T was higher. INTJ was you. No, I'm pretty sure I'm INFJ. But my T was higher, but for some reason it made me an INFJ or something. Okay. Or am I an FP, something like that. Okay. I haven't taken it in a while, but I'm something like that. But basically, at one point, he talks about this study where apparently, like, in whatever test this was, the majority of, like, polyglots were INFJ or INTJ. What was it? Do you remember what page it was? INTJ. So, if you are an INTJ, perhaps. We've got lots of... And he also said that introverts were typically also... Like, it was majority, like, people that started with an I. So, mm -hmm. we've got IN, ISFJ, cool ENFP, one. INFP, INFP, INFP. We've got a lot INTJ, of that. Dang. INTJ. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so I think, like, overall introvert we can see and like he he makes a big case for introversion in language learning because like he actually had this really weird theory that he put out that like kind of got me thinking which was like you view communication like he also put it in second person which made me like feel like he was talking to me and i was <laughs> like are you telling me that this is how i am like that makes me uncomfortable um <laughs> it was towards the end of the book and he was like, like don't speak to me hold up i may have uh bookmarked it bookmark no i just page folded um, it was real weird. He was like, you think that languages aren't real because you can't communicate with people, so you just do it because it's a system. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, what the heck are you getting at here? You can keep talking. I'm going to find this. <laughs> um, no, yeah, so I just... Like, little things like that were very interesting to me, and I don't know if I necessarily, like, learned 
something from them, but I think I at least started thinking more about them. Just, like, little things like that, like me being like, oh, is it because I'm maybe INFJ? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because now we're not, now you've got me confused by what I am. I'm pretty sure I'm INFJ. I'm Um, I'm whatever the rarest one is in the United States. That one's me. That's all I know. Look at you with your rare blood type. I'm all, yeah, I've also got the rarest blood type. I'm just a living anomaly over here. Um, Michael Ayward, please write a book about me. <laughs> um, so just, like, little things like that got me thinking a lot about just, like, myself and just, like, other people who learn languages in a way that, like, I was just intrigued and I, I want to learn more, and that's part of why I wish that the book was structured a little bit better, was just, I feel like there were so many studies that he looked up in here that... I, like, am so intrigued by now, and I want to go back and look at it at some point and find kind of more context and structure for myself. And then... I can't find what I was talking about. (laughs) I'm upset. And then just with people, um, both, like, the polyglots that he visited, like, their routines were very interesting to me. Yeah, I heard of, like, none of these people before this book, except Alexander. Yeah, I just, I gained a lot from even just hearing about how they went about their day and how they worked language learning in, like, whether it was they Mm -hmm. were people who felt that they needed to sit down for several hours a day, or whether they wanted to, yeah, his shadowing technique, or just, like, how people went about learning languages, that was Mm -hmm. something that I, I definitely enjoyed because it was, like, constantly having me rethink everything that I do. That's why I enjoy watching other people who make language learning videos, listening to language podcasts. Yeah, it, it's cool to um, see the way you do things and then, like, kind of put it over what other people do and see, like, okay, what matches, what what are they doing that I'm not, what am I doing mm-hmm. that they're not, and, like, compare and contrast that. Yeah, because I don't think it's necessarily that, like, I need to do whatever it is that they're doing because oftentimes there are things that other polyglots do that then I try and I'm like, mm, nope, does not work for me at all. Mm-hmm. But then there are things that I do that then they'll make a video and be like, never do this. And I'm like, it's working for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So. And that's, that, they actually talk about it, like, find your method and that's your yeah. method and you stay with that. Yeah, which I is think it definitely depends on the person, but I still love hearing other people's methods because there are things that I just don't think of. And so then seeing other people's, I can try it out and maybe that part of their method works for me or maybe if I changed their method just a little bit Mm -hmm. after I've started doing it and I can, like, learn how to tweak it for myself, it works for me. So it's just things like that I really enjoy in general because I feel like it really, like, pushes me to be a better language learner Mm -hmm. almost. Did he at any point, like, take any of the advice he was getting and try to learn a language? Like, I feel at one point when he was, like, in Italy, he tried... I all I, I remember, remember is though. there were a few times where people would ask him if he was a polyglot and he'd be like, No, no. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. And he was just kind of like, I'm uninterested in learning languages. And that was just kind of where I started to feel distance too, was it was very much so he was like, Tell me about your language learning technique and then they'd be like, Come learn Spanish with me and he'd be like, Nah. Yeah. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just real strange. It's like you think having an interest in this subject I mean, I guess again it's the divide between linguist and language learner which, like, we talk about a lot, but, I mean, I still think linguists have a knowledge of languages underneath them, you know? I'd also be interested to see from anyone who's maybe read one of his other books what you think, because from what I can tell, he writes other language things. (laughs) Which, yeah, which was a little bit, like, I'd known that going into this book, and then I read this book and was kind of like, wait... (laughs) Wait, back up. You spent this whole book saying that you weren't so much into learning languages yourself and you wanted to find, like, the Loch Ness Monster for language learning. But you write other language books? (laughs) Like, I was just very confused. I also would like to know if... I discovered when I was putting this on my Goodreads, he wrote a book called Mezafonti's Gift, uh, the Search for the World's Most Extraordinary Language Learners. This is Babel No More, The Search for the World's Most Extraordinary Language Learners. And it had, like, the same description. So I'm wondering if anyone oh, was it a knows different title? what the deal is with that. Yeah, they're listed as two separate books. One was published a year later. I wonder if um, it was, like, Mezzofonte's a... Gift was published a year later. Oh, and I, really? I'm very confused by whether that was, like, what was released in the UK, maybe? But from what I can tell, that was Babel No More, too. What so I, I would really like to know, is Babel No More the same book as Mezzofonte's Gift? That's Why was strange. there a name change? What the heck? What happened? <laughs> um, yeah, very confused wow. by that. Okay. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also just, like, famous, like, polyglots and hyperpolyglots. Like, I'd actually never heard of Mezzofanti. Yeah, I'd never me neither, heard which of is crazy. So many of the other people he talks about in the beginning when things are still structured and going well. Mm-hmm. Um, there was someone who he talks about who apparently Lived all of their books are still in New Britain, Connecticut, which is not necessarily close to me, but, like, excessively close. It's mm-hmm. like a, I don't know, 30 or 40 minute drive, I guess, from my house. Um, but the library apparently still has, like, their notebooks and stuff so which is so that cool. might be fun for me to go check out at some point so um i mean like things like that were just exciting and like talking about that russian girl i think it was who, who died like yeah who was like i'm going to become the best she wanted to become as a was a yeah thing. and so she like didn't sleep and she died at age like 12 14 yeah 12 14 yeah, something crazy. super young and I was like, whoa. Yeah, that Like, was these are just insane. little things that I haven't heard about. And they're, I don't think I necessarily learned anything from that about my own language learning, other than, like, I should sleep. No, it was sleep, just neat which is learning like the history of knew, language but, learning. Like, yeah. the history of language learning is so undocumented. And, like, by undocumented, I mean, like, it's just not talked about. Like, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, it's shown that people have learned languages and, like, been multilingual throughout history. But I just mean, like, how people do it mm-hmm. hasn't necessarily, like, always been talked about, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's very interesting. And also, um, I was talking to Matt about this recently. One of the things I'm really excited about for this book club in general is I almost only read fiction ever. Um, and that's Same. all I've read throughout, like, my whole life. But there's so much to gain from reading nonfiction for, like, your own creative endeavors, too, with, like, us as writers yeah. as well. Um, I mean, like, like, I think it's so helpful to read nonfiction. So I'm very excited just to, like, learn a bunch of stuff from the book club. Um, <laughs> same. Yeah, me too, Dana. <laughs> like, l- no, speaking of that, like, I'm reading uh, Ursula K. Le Guin right now, uh, The Left Hand of Darkness, and literally, like, her dad's an anthropologist, and, like, mm-hmm. she talks about the importance of, like, non... She's like, if you only read fiction, you're only gonna, like, know things that are in fiction. Yeah. But the things that... The things that people know specifics about in reality, you can then take into your reality mm-hmm. and, like seem like a genius in these topics which yeah, was like exactly it's really interesting to think about because like i love linguistic fictions mm-hmm. and like learning more about that for me is really interesting mm-hmm. just like yeah and i love like etymologies and things like that so looking at this and like how the human brain deals with it was really interesting for me and like gripping in that sense mm-hmm. yeah i don't know man i didn't even i didn't give a rating I don't like to rate books. I like this entire thing to be... I have, like... I don't like reading books as of recently because I feel like it's unfair for all that goes into this mm. to give it, like, a star thing. Um, though I don't know if I'm going to stay with that belief. But nonetheless... Um, I mean, I'm not discrediting, I think, no, the, of course, the amount of work that, that... I do think a lot of work went into this, and mm-hmm. that's why I'm almost so, like... I'm almost, like, frustrated at how, how unstructured you... it was, just yeah. because I feel like had he gone through, like, that's what I said, is I feel like it was, like, without a pass, so, like, I wish that he'd gone back and, um, like, kind of just mm-hmm. structured it a little bit better. No, <laughs> I, can, been nice. I completely agree. Um, and, like, I gotta say, the effort and, like, all the places he traveled, like, mm-hmm. I want to know how he funded all that. Because uh, actually, it says in the back he oh, was, it? he uh, won an, a white writing fellowship award to work on this book. Oh, nice. Okay, because he literally goes like everywhere, and it's really impressive at just uh, like Gun Gunaman Eric Gunaman was that him? Do you remember? I don't know. He was I think Swedish or Danish, and um, he was a really interesting fellow that he followed for a little. Or no, he followed a student of his. Or something because he passed away um and that was really interesting just looking at like the little histories like the sub histories of these polyglots and like um just the impact they make like and he talks about the distinction between a polyglot and their community which i think is really cool because mm-hmm. like um i think i don't know about you but like i have a history of that at least personally like with how my school viewed me as like the language learner kid and like it's weird how you become, like, prized for your ability 
and it's like oh but I just put work towards this like yeah, that, that artist exactly she does the too. same amount of work as mm-hmm. I do and look at what she's painting it's like it's like I also can't prove to you that any of what I'm doing is real like I can only prove that with a native speaker or another speaker mm-hmm. and like so I can just say words to you and you can think I say this that and the other mm-hmm. thing you know so it's really interesting how like again that like fetishization of polylautism which I think yeah. is like I think it's natural for people to do because we prize difference a lot of the time but it's concerning you know at least like it, it's just uncomfortable because you like the po- the polyglot of Flanders how like his town would like interview him and interview him and interview him yeah. and like it became like he was sick of it and like I don't know if this is true but I have a theory like that's probably why Tim doesn't make as many videos anymore. Like, he probably just got sick of it, you know? hmm And, like, you know, we're, we're lucky to still have, like, Richard Simca making, doing things in the community because, like, I imagine he's, he's at the level of, like, many of the people talked about in this book. Um, I think we're just also lucky. I mean, technically this book was still written with, like, the internet age, but I don't know. No, yeah, I think it was. YouTube's become a much more popular thing, and, like, owning a blog has become a much more popular thing, and I think we're now, at least luckily, in a time frame where people can kind of not necessarily interview themselves, but, like, they have control over what they're saying It's like an autobi- well. autobiography, you mm-hmm. know? So, like, people can publish about their own language learning, but that's got a lot of control under it. You can do it when you feel like it and then not when yeah, you don't feel yeah, like it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a lot whereas, more agency in that. Yeah, whereas just having, like, TV reporters be like, tell us about how you learn 400 languages, and, and you're then, like, I only speak three. <laughs> and then, again, I think we need to look at um, the geography of language learning and mm-hmm. talk about how in India, where he ta- where he went for a, a good portion of the book, uh, not not too long, like maybe half a chapter, um, and he meets with all these people and is astounded by their ability to, s- to just, like, say, like, oh, you know, I speak, I'm not going to name the languages because I'm going to get them wrong, but, like, I speak these four, and then another person has a different three, and then another person has, like, two, and another person has, like, seven. And it was incredible for me, like, in the beginning, and he's astounded, too, so he wants you to be astounded with him. And it's, like, looking at these people as geniuses just all over the place and then realizing, like, oh, all of these language have languages have the same grammar, mm-hmm. a lot of the same sounds carry over, um, the script is, like, hardly different, and so, like, really you're just fitting the same things into different patterns, and, like, it's kind of just, like, plugging a new vocabulary to the same structure. And so, like, that's, again, where he kind of, like, punches multilingualism and is, like, it's not yeah. that big a deal. But but then, but then what he does is, like, multilingualism and polyglotism in this area isn't important because everybody does it. But look in Europe where, like, English is a lingua franca, or, like, if you're in Germany, like, it's it's a big deal to speak, like, mm-hmm. seven languages. That's not a common thing in, like, England or America, you know? Where English literally reigns, and yeah. you can't escape it. But then having someone who does speak, like, four or more, like, g- God bless if you've got two, you know? Like, and <laughs> that's probably just from, like, high school that you don't remember, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, like, things like that where I can totally tell, like, I feel like I can totally tell at least Mm -hmm. what his point was trying to be, and I think it was meant to, I I think where it kind of fell apart with, like, sometimes he'd seem totally, like, enamored by it, and sometimes he'd seem like he was discrediting everything, was I think it was meant to come at it in the sense of, like, this thing that seems so crazy and cool, like, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. But I think... No, I agree. The, just the structure and just some of the writing and stuff just made it come across as, like, sometimes he's like, wow, this is so cool, but then he'd be like, but not really that cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and it didn't so much feel like, no, this is something really special, but everyone can have this special thing. Like, which I think which was, was special, kind of... special, you know? And, like, I just think his wording that didn't come across as well no, as he exactly, wanted. No, exactly, yeah. And I don't know if I'm just really cynical reading this book and, like, anytime he got excited and then not excited i viewed it as like a like slashing down everything else he just said and like everything i, I think believe, there was you know? just like a better structure to it i think it was just the same structural problem that we mm-hmm. were having yeah but um yeah i think it's interesting just i saw a thing recently that was kind of like oh like you shouldn't why do we like praise people for speaking multiple languages when like tons of people speak them around the world and but again, i think something that almost the, this the book argument. showed me is that um like there it's a different thing because I was of that mentality for a while but I almost feel like there is 
some credit There's in merit learning in yeah. languages. Because the thing is, is like, let's say you live somewhere where you have to speak three languages for whatever reason. Like, one is like a local language, one is what you Look take at like Kenya. That sort of thing. Let's say you have to speak three South languages. Africa. Still learning something that isn't something that you have to use every single day, like isn't your local language, the language you speak at home or the language you speak at school, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, it's going to be difficult, and so there's still merit to it, and that's, like, where a monolingual is starting with. And, like, is it really amazing that some people speak three languages instead of one from the beginning? Yes, but still them adding their fourth and the monolingual adding their second is still, like... I think both of those are special, and I think it's one of those things where, like, learning languages after your previous basis still holds merit because like we said it's not just something your predisposition to do like it involves studying Mm -hmm. and so I think it's not to discredit someone learning like Spanish from in the U.S. and having them learn that as a second language like that doesn't make it bad because tons of people here are bilingual and speak English and Spanish already like I think then that person learning English and Spanish them adding French or something like Mm -hmm. that's also special and I think like putting in the effort to learn another way of communicating is has, always good. Yeah, know? has its own level of specialness. And I mean, I don't think we should hold these people up as like gods or anything. Yeah, because, like, and I think that's a danger that he doesn't really address. Yeah, like that's the thing is I think we just need to not praise these people as though it's like they're born with a special gift when it is that we just sit with textbooks. But I think, <laughs> yeah, I think like an American learning a language or someone else in a country that's typically monolingual learning a second language holds as much merit as someone who speaks three languages in another country learning a fourth language yeah i i think the thing is like because he talks about linguistic repertoire Mm -hmm. and like the thing is with similarities between languages adding to a repertoire like I, i think i'm someone who's like always cautious of this because i'm like oh german and norwegian and then French, Spanish, Italian, and it's like all of these help each other, you know, like they all add to one another, but they are different systems. So, you know, I think there is, there is, there's like a a grain of salt there that needs to be addressed that like, yes, they're similar, but they're still different. Yeah. I I mean, I mean, I think it was also interesting because I often think about that and I think I often like, oh, don't want to like learn all of these languages that are super similar. And like, I think I also like it's a bad thing that I do this, but I think sometimes I do look at other people who learn a lot of languages, and I'm like, oh, but they speak all the, like, romance languages. Like, they're yeah. all super similar. No, you t- I totally do but, that, too. and that's something I definitely need to stop myself from doing, especially after reading this one. He was like, it's a misconception that people do that. Mm-hmm. Most people who speak multiple languages choose to go to things different. that are totally different. Yeah. And so it's actually not a thing that a lot of people, like, pick up all the romance languages. And, like, yeah, it's I, one of I those things. I think a good, like, contemporary example of that is, like, Lindy Bullets. Her mm-hmm. repertoire is like vast, and mm-hmm. sure you can say um, geographically some of them are very close, but linguistically those are very different languages, mm-hmm. and like I think that's very impressive to me. Whereas if I see like if I look at my own and I see like oh French, Spanish, Italian, I'm like, come on, mm-hmm. you know, and like I do think that's like a a thing that I shouldn't necessarily say because you know I'm putting in the effort still, and like they are different. And I mean, struggling with Italian right now, like, it's not easy. You know, that's the thing. But I think even then, like, I think I often, even knowing that it's so much like that, I'm like, ah, yeah, I just learned the romance languages. Or, like, this other person, like... I learned all of them. This other person, like, they just focus on romance languages, so obviously they're going to pick up things faster. I know. That's uh, why they picked all these up. Also known as Latin. Should I compare myself to other people? No. Do I sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, Um, no, totally. But I mean, I think then sometimes I'm like, oh, but like they speak all the Germanics. Like they learn things that are very similar and stuff. Mm -hmm. But like he like literally discredits that and is like, people don't do that so much. People will jump around from like Spanish to Arabic to Chinese. Yeah, I was actually just going to say that example. Like that's more common. So yeah, so I think that was just, that like kept me in line. I was like, hmm, I think I'll stop that. (laughs) So (laughs) I think that was nice and just like another like fun thing to learn Mm. no i completely agree Uh, yeah it it opens it opens the doors to a lot of arguments that aren't talked about a lot but i think something that we need to address if we haven't addressed it yet is like the like sexism in the book yeah um to get on to things that we like to move on from things that we learn to things that we disagree with yeah. Um, is Ophelia here right now? <laughs> I don't know. Because I didn't. Well, I didn't watch her review yet, but I know she. Ta- I talked yet. about it. With, her Tomorrow. Not up? 
tomorrow catch Ophelia not liking this book. Okay. Um, so for anyone who's not aware, our friend Ophelia Barrett, she makes videos here on YouTube too. Um, she read the book, gave it a one star. <laughs> um, on Goodreads. I think she would have probably even given a lower star if she could have given it zero stars. She really did not like the book. Mm -hmm. um, so if she's I here can find right examples, now, by the she way. might have some things to contribute. I'd also love to hear if you guys did read the book, um, kind of things that you learned from it as well, and then you can also join oh, wow. in now with things that you didn't like. But there was a bit of things that were like a little also, sexist. Uh, kind um, of a lot. <laughs> like, it's it's sad that it's as sexist as it is because like the comments that he makes don't need to be made. That's the thing. They don't. No, they don't. They're just extra. And they all started at the very end of the book, unless I did not pick them up earlier. I didn't pick up anything throughout which was the beginning. Which part until... of the problem. Okay, Ophelia also liked the book at first, but changed her opinion. Yeah, I think that <laughs> yeah. was the thing, is the book started off very on topic with one topic, sexism-free, <laughs> um, yeah. all these other things, and then it went on, and then... He felt like, oh, you know, I'm getting this writing thing down. I can put some of my own opinions in here. And it's like, mm, then that it, wasn't um, a good idea. kind of fell apart. Um, yeah. yeah, no, there were a few things. Uh, Ophelia's have... favorite line, some women are hyper polyglots, but most are men. Um, also a favorite of mine. Wow, what a line. Um, <laughs> um, which then he says, it, it was also very weird. Something I also didn't like about this book is the studies that he conducted I don't know a whole lot about conducting studies, but from what I know, you need more than 15 people, which was what he had in his things. And then, so he was like, oh, like, 75% were men, and it was like, uh, it's like that's, you had that's like 11 people. Yeah. Like, so... No, it, it wasn't a big... Like, he talks about the neural tribe all the time, and it's like, dude, 15 people isn't, like, a lot. Like, you should have 100. And yeah. with the internet, it's not hard. So it seemed a bit strange where he was like, oh, well, based on my research, like, most, mostly it's men who are, um, like, this. So I, it was just very mm -hmm. confusing. And, um, I, yeah, it was very weird. And that comment he kind of went back on and was like, oh, well, maybe it's just men who wanted to say that they, like, spoke all these languages, which I guess, okay, maybe kind of clears it up, but at the same time, I don't think it was necessary to begin yeah, with. Yeah, he, he talks about, um, like, the, the macho gusto of showing how smart you are and, like, how men are more likely just uh, statistically to, like, inflate their ability to impress others and, like, women are more likely to be humble. And I feel like... I don't know, I'm much more, if this is how it is, then I'm much more, like, female in that aspect. Because I, like, totally deflate my abilities. And I don't like to say that that's a female thing to do. You know what well, I mean? Well, I think what it's more so is is that, like, this goes in a separate con con conversation about, like, yeah. sexism and stuff. I think it's more so, like, due to, like, societal things, like, women are less likely to, are, are more self-conscious. So I think it's just you're more yeah. self-conscious, and then women in general due to societal like pressures and things like that more self-conscious but mm -hmm. that's like a whole other no but, conversation. but he does touch on that in here so i don't no, think it's it irrelevant does, yeah you know? yeah so it was just like little things like that because i think the problem more so is that had he said something like oh is it is there like a thing like like much like the structural issues he starts off talking about mezzofanti then he kind of goes into a travel log then he's like maybe here's why people are polyglots but he, so it's not like he's like from the beginning is there a correlation between sex is there a correlation between gender is there a correlation between sexuality is there a mm -hmm. correlation between mental divergences is there a correlation between all these sort of things with being a polyglot it's just at the end suddenly he, like, he's like oh but like are there women who speak languages yeah it was like an afterthought which i really didn't so like. that's kind of what bothered me the most i think had he like gone throughout the whole book being like is there are these things correlated at all or not it's yeah also andy pointed out there is a women in language online conference yes. starting tomorrow so um to avoid being like this can i please go to that <laughs> I agree. He talks about, um, which is a thing that I've never heard of, so, like, again, one of the, like, scientific things that he brings up that I found interesting was, um, uh, this woman, Lorraine, I don't know her last name, I can't find it, uh, talks about the 
Geschwind or Geschwind Galiberta hypothesis, which links occurrences among dyslexia, gender, handedness, and other traits. Mm -hmm. As examples, there is a predominance of left handedness among talented visual artists, and males are only overwhelmingly more often dyslexic and artistic. And then it talk go it goes into more of this uh, study, which yeah. I found really interesting. Because, so I think like, something like that, had he touched more on it, would have been okay. Like I, mm -hmm. I think that the line, like. I don't know, but then again, it could have just... The the writing of some polyglots are women, but most are men. Yeah. It wasn't like, is there a correlation? It was just, there might be some women who learn languages, but probably not too many. Also... Like, that's just unscientific to say something like that. We did get a comment that. that, interestingly enough, correlates back to that. Um, I read a book about that, the differences between how men and women communicate, yeah. and basically the main hypothesis is that men seek respect more while women seek more of a community. Interesting. Which I think sums up that kind of thing. Okay. And more of the, like, self-conscious kind of thing. I think it's yeah. just more, like, conditioning and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, it, it just all felt a little weird at the end. He was like, maybe these people have autism. Maybe they have OCD and, like, to organize the languages in their head and just things like that. Um, yeah. Also, Maxon says there's a lot of issues with women being underdiagnosed with autism, too. So, like, saying that men are more... Interesting. So, Interesting. yeah, it's that... Wow. I actually didn't know that fact. Me neither. But, um, yeah, it's things like that that kind of came up within the last, I think, like, 20 or 30 pages. Oh, yeah. It was, like, in his final review of the book, <laughs> he was just like, there might be women who speak languages. Maybe all these people I know are autistic. Like... Hmm. all these kind of last minute thoughts thrown in there that uh, just kind of felt very weird and like very much so like please don't say these things right now because it it didn't like again it just didn't feel handled with care like it was very much so kind of thrown in there yeah it's very and felt like, very much so shot. from an outsider's point of view too like there are and it's one of those things that just makes me upset too because there are so many people that constantly throw that thing around of, like, there aren't women polyglots or hyperpolyglots or, like, where are they? Mm -hmm. um, Ophelia tagged me in something recently where there was someone who was like, man, I wonder why the, why are there no, like, women in language learning? Like, posed it as a question for people to answer, and Ophelia was like, oh, I didn't know that these, and, like, listed a bunch <laughs> of us, like, people didn't exist. Um, who, who was it that said that? Do you I know? don't. I don't know and I don't remember, but okay. it, it's just one of those things where, like, it's fr so frequently said, but there are so many people that have, like, even amazing, like, language blogs and things, mm -hmm. and, like, the whole Women in Language, um, like, uh, conference. conference was surrounded around this, like, the, the polyglot conferences and gatherings and stuff very frequently have male speakers, even though there's so many, so there's, like, mm -hmm. 25 speakers, and that's... I can. I even know a ton of women who do this kind of thing who aren't speaking there because they can't have an infinite number of speakers. So like, mm -hmm. just it's very strange when people say that, and it, it does again feel like people just haven't done research. Search like that very much so felt like something where Michael hadn't done enough research into language learning and that sort of thing because his sample size seemed very small for a study that yes. I, kind of made it feel very weird and kind of like a school project kind of <laughs> level of things. I want to um, see, he has his uh, study in the appendix, so I want to see how many people he... I believe he said there were 15 or something like that, and then like mostly women, there were like eight women who filled out his other thing that was like, do you speak one language? And they were yeah. like, yeah, I've studied some, but I'm not a polyglot or whatever. Yeah. And so it just felt very weird. His sample sizes seemed very slim, and then he, like, was talking to people, and, like, he kept quotes that kind of seemed very weird, and it just felt like there wasn't enough research put into knowing that if you Doesn't dug, sound. like just slightly further you would have found that there were lots of women who learn languages yeah. as well and would have been happy to talk about learning languages and that sort of thing yeah i agree i want to i think that's interesting what andy brought up with um most teachers in the u.s are women because i've had that experience as well with just most of my teachers being women i've had one male teacher in language learning mm. i know your professor right now is a male yeah, but, I only had females going through mm -hmm. and public school. Though. I I kind of think it's interesting this. Phenomenon. Actually, I had a male Spanish teacher. Oh really? Because we were just talking, I think last night about the Oscars. Like it's ninety years 
of mm. Oscars, and now finally women are just starting to be recognized yeah, in the awards. Yeah, that's kind of what this end felt like. It's what like, it feels like. Was that the, the Oscars being like, we have our first female cinematography no- nominee, and I like was watching and I was like, it's been 90 years. <laughs> There's been female cinematographers in that time. Mm-hmm. And so it's just kind of one of those things where he's like, most polyglots are men, but some might be women. And it's like, there are definitely women out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think that was just a very silly remark to make. because Yeah, and it just, it all felt very thrown in there. And I think it's why Ophelia probably had the same point, kind of, that Matt and I did, where we enjoyed the beginning and then... Because it wasn't problematic in the beginning. It it, it kind of fell apart towards the end. Like, it had a structure. Everything was okay. I was like, I'm going to learn things. I'm going to feel inspired. And then things went on, and I was like... (laughs) He's like, oh, There were also, just, just to add to it, like, there were a few points, again, towards the end, where he said just, like, off the hand sexist things yeah, that that's weren't what I was language about to, related. I was about to, to read that out before. Like there was there's the I? comment at one point. The lap. Yeah. Well, first, first I have um, he, he's talking about someone's wife, which like, I think it's also just annoying that like, any time a woman is brought up, he uh, there's someone's wife, mm. which was just like really annoying for me. Um. Oh wow. He appears to be well-fed and well-loved. He meets one's gaze with equanimity, laughs at jokes, pauses to let Linda finish a comment, and she always has a comment to finish, herself a language adventurer. She studied Mandarin and Russian in preparation for a trip on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and she wooed Johan in the early 1990s by writing a Christmas card to him in a language he'd invented. Somehow he was lucky enough to find one of what are likely few women on the planet who suit him. Wow. And then there was also a comment where he was like, Is that after the there's a then? woman in a miniskirt getting on a boat, and he's like, for every like woman that help, hoped she fell, there was a man hoping she fell across their laps or something. And it was just like one of those things that... Didn't need to be is, said. Yeah, this, this is, is about, about language learning. Yeah. What the heck? Yeah, so it was just like little things like that, that towards the end I was just kind of like, this is moving in a direction that I really don't like. Yeah. And... And, like, those comments were within 15 pages of one another, which is really scary. So it was very weird. It felt like the structure fell apart, and then he went on on this own thing that just got very, like, problematic very fast. Um, It wasn't about uh, languages, and then when it was, it was kind of discrediting people learning languages, and then it was sexist comments that (laughs) kind of made me not want to continue reading the book. So I think just overall, like, that, that, those are things that I disagree with. Yeah. (laughs) Um... I don't think I had any other things other than, like, what I already mentioned with, like, him talking about, like, why people learn languages, where I was mm-hmm. like, I know that this is not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, what were his reasons for why, like, job opportunities and... No, just things like, uh, collecting, like, number oh, of words, Oh, that was know, ridiculous. That like, I feel all, like, all obsessive tendencies. And yeah. I was like, I was like, this isn't... I was like, yes, I'm a bibliophile, but I don't have language books. Like, the language books I have that I haven't touched, I know I haven't touched them. It just felt like, it's like the correlations, too, again, like, I feel like there was a lot of research done, but at the same time, the research wasn't It wasn't accurately interpreted. Through, almost, <clears throat> like, when he was like, there might be a correlation between OCD and <clears throat> language learning. I bet it's because they want to structure, they want to, like, <laughs> organize their language books and structure the, the, the words show. that they know and stuff in their head. And I'm like, no. Um, no, I, I got into it when he was talking about systemization, though. I think that OCD probably plays a role in it. Because he was also saying it's because they, like, won't let themselves, like, leave studies and stuff. And I don't think that's the case. I think OCD, like, it's made me a more organized person, I guess. Like, it definitely contributes to me being very organized and, like, that sort of thing. And, um, I guess maybe building habits. But even then, I don't think so because there's a de- there's a difference between compulsions and habits. Mm. And I think that's something that he, it felt like he did not understand. Yes, it seems like um, he views, he viewed specifically Alexander's habits as compulsions. And maybe, yeah. maybe they were a bit compulsive, but like, I, I bet him writing this book was compulsive more than habitual, like, or, or the other way around. Like, I just think that distinction wasn't made, you know? Yeah, just because it felt a lot like o- OCD correlates to language learning because of this and i like i said i don't know if there's a correlation between people who have ocd and people who learn languages i don't Mm -hmm. think that science knows that yet yeah um 
but <laughs> yeah, I it just kind of felt like everything wasn't fully followed through in the end with research, and there was another point too that I don't remember what it was, but um, also just he, he was so uncomfortable talking about the one um, I was he autistic, the one person Chris that he like interviewed and like studied uh kind of in the middle of the book he just seemed so uncomfortable talking about him and his language abilities and it made me sad that he was handling mm. that content like that mm. like yeah it just felt a lot of things weren't handled i think well enough i think a lot of this i think the beginning was handled well and i almost feel like there's a possibility that he had that and he didn't know what to do for the rest of the <laughs> book and that could Which totally like, not be the case, but it kind of felt like the, the beginning was held with, with so much more care and structure and yeah. research and things, and then it was just his experience, and it felt more like kind of a running diary and stream of thought that didn't have as much care for the people he was talking about, mm -hmm. follow through with the research that he'd done, structure with how he was writing it, and could have reorganized the book and things, and just things like that um mm -hmm. just because like i do feel like there were a few things where he'd mention things and like when he was like dope you got to keep your dopamine up to study languages <laughs> that was interesting if that was the case i wouldn't know any languages <laughs> the dopamine levels in my brain are not that high um but it's just like little things like that with no psychological diagnosis on Alexander. There's no way to know for sure if his habits were fully or at all OCD. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's things like that. And just, it did feel very much so like even me not even knowing, I think the way he worded it was very much so if people are studying a language every day, they must have to do this because of OCD. And yeah. I think that discredits the fact that people with OCD can also struggle with doing things like that like with having the motivation to sit down and study a textbook for an hour i think there are actually very few people who would have studying with a textbook for an hour as a compulsion for ocd i was gonna say normally it's a negative thing it doesn't like always well, or even manifest then, positively like, it would likely be something else like i think studying would kind of like i don't know how to explain it properly but i think that that saying that that's a compulsion like shows a clear lack of knowledge about what OCD is and what compulsions are like for people with OCD. Mm -hmm. And so saying that, like, sitting down and studying takes away the fact that these people probably have to discipline themselves to si still sit down and study, and even if you have OCD, yeah. chances are you're then blocking out other compulsions in order to sit down and study, unless mm -hmm. for some reason you feel like... Because compulsions are completely, like, you feel like something bad is going to happen if you're not doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And so sitting down and studying, I guess maybe you can feel... It, it's just not the same. I don't know. No, yeah. It was Without strange. being a psychologist, I don't feel like I have the right words <laughs> to explain my like disagreement with yeah. that. But it just felt very much so like a, a clear lack of knowledge in the disorders that he was talking about. And with depression as well. Um yeah, just mm -hmm. scatterbrain and stuff. Yeah, like, both of us, I think, we are, are comfortably able to admit that we have OCD and, like, yeah. in different forms, oh, yeah. too. No, like, you totally have different more so, like... Thoughts. Yeah, so it's kind of, like, following a train of thought. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, like, so I, I can see how that relates to language learning because I, like, can obsess over phrases and mm -hmm. things like that and, like, words themselves, you know? But, like, do I necessarily think that that's why I'm a language learner? No. You know what I mean? Yeah, I just... No, <laughs> the author seems like a character, I know. Yeah, it feels um, very... I, I do want to, like, uh, have, like, a... What do I want to say? What's this called? A caveat of, like, read this book if you want to read it. We shouldn't be the reason you don't read the book. Yeah. But, like, make your own opinions of this. Don't just take our opinions, because, like that's not a good thing to do yeah this is book club it's meant to be a conversation yeah um and so also if you read this after we're talking about this now you can feel free to like still discuss it in the comments no of um, course and like we're happy to talk about it still because i'm sure our opinions will change a bit perhaps for the better perhaps for the worse i'm very excited for ophelia's review i thought it was already out no it's not out yet tomorrow. okay my gosh i'm i'm like so excited though i can't wait to see that yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. If you want to hear the book probably be roasted, I'd say watch Ophelia's <laughs> review because I know she really didn't like it. Um, 
But we are going to. Oh, we should announce the new book. Yeah, we've got the next book. I will read it aloud because it's got a long title. Um, but other than that, that's kind of what we have. I guess actually, let's. Anyone have any questions about things about the book to ask us? Mm-hmm. Obviously, we can't answer things like how long did it take to write and things because we <laughs> didn't write it. But um, I guess just about our opinions. Yes. Um, we had some fun fun talks here. Yeah, I also think about our, structure and I, I sexism think... <laughs> and OCD. <laughs> I think our opinion should also be taken with, like, a most of this book we read a long time ago and finished very recently. Not today, though. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so I will announce the next book is going to be How to Learn Any Language in a Few Months While Enjoying Yourself by Nate Nicholson. <laughs> so whoever before said to death with those books that are like, learn a language in X amount of time, we're going to give one of those a shot. It's going to be in a few months without, w- with, while enjoying yourself. <laughs> Listen, a few months are not um, a specified number, so that's good. And so we're going to read this. I know that I said I wanted to split book club into like a two-month event, but we are going to read this in one month because it's a very quick book. It's like 80 pages, I think. I think it's only 80 pages, at Something least. like that. So um, the next book club meeting um, <laughs> will be happening first week of April. Um I'm not entirely sure what the exact date will be. Again, it's going to depend on kind of what our lives are like. Oh, maybe we should do it. spring break. Yes. That might be helpful. <laughs> um, might so I'll announce it like a few weeks again ahead of time, much like this one. And uh, we will we'll have an upload schedule very and shortly. And an upload <laughs> schedule will get tweeted out tonight. Um, we might be taking a little mini hiatus mm-hmm. um, before we come back. But if we don't take a little mini hiatus, it'll still be... We're not going to be uploading as frequently, obviously, because we did it for For a a month. month. We are going to get on a regular upload schedule, though. We might just take a month off or, like, a shorter period of time. Probably not a whole month, honestly. No, I I think, if anything, the break that we'll be taking will be so we can have frequent content again. Because I think we realize now that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because, like, I, I, like, batch made a lot of those videos before I was even back at school. So then I would just have to make the thumbnails and they would go up. And so that was really like good for me that they were all made and edited already. So like I think yeah. doing that again would be helpful. We just want, we, we've we been so busy with school and stuff that we feel like we want some time to kind of like do the language learning part Do the of language this. learning, yeah, And definitely. then like get sort of experience in order to talk about it again. And then um, also like stock up on videos and then post it again. Yeah, if anything, I feel like maybe live streams intermittently throughout then. Yeah, I think we'll probably be live streaming even if we do take a hiatus. Like, we'll probably be live streaming pretty frequently mm-hmm. just because we I'm can kind of our power do held that. Out. I know. We've got a blizzard going on right now. <laughs> and it seems like the live stream isn't too bad, which means the internet's good. So that's good. This was a good live stream. Okay. I'm sorry that we, like, only smashed on this book. Um, uh, we had some good things. We had some good things. I know Andy said before that this was, like, what started the current or, like, contemporary polyglot movement, which I think is interesting. Mm. Um, I didn't take that into account when I read it. I guess because you can't... I didn't know what happened after this book. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. I'm interesting. T- I'm interested to, like, read up now on more, like, other reviews of the mm-hmm. book because I'm sure people like just skipped over the sexist things and like just the problematic well, stuff. Well, there were a few things that I didn't even pick up on that then you were like, did you read this? And I was like, yeah. oh, because yeah. it was just things where I was kind of focused on like, oh, cool, scientific study. And then I like would miss the whole like sexist bit. And then I was like, yikes, that was there. Yeah. Um, and admittedly, that was because I was like reading it kind of quickly because I had to finish the book today. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um but then going back they are there and i just feel like the end like the last 30 pages were really bad for all that sort of thing and like that lack of structure the beginning was really good yeah, so no, strong that's start. kind of what felt for me like he kind of gave up and i i like to think that that's not what happened because i'm sure he did put a lot of work into this but it kind of felt like there mm-hmm. was kind of a giving up when it came to structure and things yeah like and i was excited too when he started getting like statistics and charts and all of that but then he only used that to say comments that i didn't agree with <laughs> and i was like oh you didn't that was an interesting way to interpret that graph you know yeah so yeah so yeah i hope our next book is better it's basically i think it's 45 <laughs> tips for learning languages um so i'm excited neat. about that um 
we'll see how we feel about the book in general, and then other than that, we'll probably spend most of the next book club, like, talking about tips, and, like, maybe we'll even give them a, a shot for ourselves, and then talk about yeah, whether we good. felt that they worked for us. And, that'd be good. I'd like to. Um, that sort of thing. That'd be more interactive. I'd like that, you know? Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Some live feedback from that. <laughs> also, as we said earlier, um, and a, a lot of new people joined since then, but, um, since this is our first book club meeting and just our first book club at all, um, we're definitely still testing out how to run this. So if you have any suggestions or feedback about how we ran today or how we run the book club in general, definitely let us know. Fluent Forever is on our list, so no you worries there. Though, right? I've already read Fluent Forever, yeah. so we didn't want to do it this time around just because we want to wait until... I've read a few books because I want to read. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, yeah, there is a Kindle version and an Audible ver- version of the next book. So there's that. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, that if you're not in the Discord but want to be able to talk about the book throughout the month, you can join the Discord. There's a book club section. Not a lot of people use that this time around, so I'm not sure how much that's going to stick around because a bit of it is just us talking about it here at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if you have any tips for restructuring the kind of live stream i feel like this went yeah. fairly well but no, if you yeah, have anything I, you'd like to add in please let us know we apologize for not for like the lack of communication but like that was our structure going into mm-hmm. it so like if that's something you want more of like because there's a difference i guess like we, we said this is like a video slash like podcast live stream mm-hmm. podcast hybrid kind of so cool i like yeah. i liked it though this was I, yeah. this was neat because also it wasn't like we ignored the comments like we see you guys. We, we know see. you're here. We, we, we're we reading this. <laughs> we're just not saying anything back. Like, all of the comments on our channel. <gasps> oh, shoot. <laughs> Maybe a Goodreads club. I like Ooh. that. I like that. And, okay, we will put a link to the Discord in the chat momentarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, should I end the live stream? Yeah, so I think we're going to get going, but we will post that. And I will also add to the description a link to buy the new book we do have an amazon affiliates link so we'll get a little bit of money from it but um it's like a cent other than yeah we get like a penny <laughs> He's literally, um, don't worry so uh Thank yeah also you. like you won't be charged anything extra so yes. but it'll be there if you want to buy it through us if not you can buy it on your own if you don't want to do that i get it um <laughs> thank so, you to yeah. the i believe we've got five or six patrons over on patreon right now mm-hmm. which is insane uh during the month of vedf which is what we're gonna what we're gonna January, call February, Beth, for, March. I agree. Um, Patreon like exploded, and it was really neat and just nice. So we we appreciate your support over there. We're going to be figuring out like along with our upload schedule, like our things for doing things on Patreon, um, and just social media and whatnot. We're gonna get our life together. Gonna so. get our st- stuff yeah. going. Cool. Okay. All right. So thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. And. Have a good stay safe if you're in this blizzard, guys. And remember, Babel no more. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs>